So if I summarize, last week uh, we discussed how to find the, the node cases and then uh, the main properties. Then we also look like, looked at uh, the exposure conditions. Then we talked about uh, member subject to flexure, the stress block, and how to deal with uh, single reinforced. And uh, doubly reinforced beams. And then we also discussed how to deal with flange beams. And we considered one of the extreme cases that is, you know, flange beam needing uh, compression reinforcement when it is very heavily loaded. So today we'll uh, look at shear, which will consist of direct shear, punching shear. And then uh, we'll, uh, we can uh, talk about the design of uh, footings. First, we'll uh, deal with shear. So can you all hear me? Can I get some response? Aruna, can you all hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, my, my speakers are muted, that's right. So now you can hear me, is that right? Yes, sir. All right, good. All right, today we'll talk about uh, design for shear. So last time also I said that, you know, we are talking about this uh, variable struct inclination method. So uh, we have to define uh, some parameters. One is, uh, you know, when you are in these Euro codes, uh, you can see the notations are a little different. So we are DC means the design shear resistance of members without shear reinforcement. Uh, and uh, VRDS means the shear force that can be sustained by uh, when you have reinforcement to resist shear. And VRD max is the maximum value of shear force, which can be uh, resisted by uh, any compression, any concrete member, because here the failure occurs due to the crushing of concrete. So this is the maximum value. And uh, this is the design value when you have reinforcement. This is the value that the member can carry in shear without having reinforcement. So, uh, so basically the rule is, if the shear is uh, less than this value, if the shear force is less than this value, then you need only the nominal reinforcement. And if the shear is more than this value, then you have to design the reinforcement and the shear can never exceed this value. So there are three values. Here you need nominal reinforcement. Here you are actually having the reinforcement. And one of the important differences in Euro codes is uh, when you are providing reinforcement, it ignores the contribution by concrete. It assumes that you know all the shear is resisted by steel. And uh, here, if the shear force is more than this value, that means you know you have to use a bigger section. You have to use a bigger section. So that, that's the importance of these three values. Here nominal, here the shear is given by carrying capacity of reinforcement, shear reinforcement. And if the shear exceeds this value, then you have to use a larger section. 
So to calculate the shear capacity of concrete, a basic equation is given. And uh, here you can see uh, you get uh, steel ratio. It's a function of amount of steel provided. It's a function of concrete strength. And it's a function of depth. This K factor takes account of the depth of the section, effect of depth of the section. And also there's a minimum value for a section. And, uh, and you know, if this gives a value less than this, then you have to use this one. So there's a minimum shear capacity for a concrete section and it cannot be, and the, if this gives a value less than this, then this covers. Otherwise, this will go. So you can see uh, VRDC is the design shear resistance of the section without shear reinforcement. And here K factor looks after the effect of depth. And uh, it has a maximum value of two. That means if D is 200 millimeters, then K is two. If the depth is more than 200 millimeters, K will be less than two. But it will be always greater than one as well. And uh, Rho gives the amount of steel available because steel also can resist shear to a certain extent. And uh, this is the area of reinforcement, longitudinal reinforcement. And uh, BW is the width of the section because in shear, we use only the rib. We don't use flanges because shear is uh, most critical in the, in the middle. And in flange sections, the middle part is generally only the rib. So we use only the rib or the width of the wing. So this is the method that is used yeah, that is a truss analogy. The only difference is this angle is not fixed. It is a variable angle. And this angle can vary between 22 to 45 degrees. This angle can vary between 22 and 45 degrees. So in this analogy, the tension is carried by reinforcement. So these are truss analogy. So we assume that you know shear is resisted by using a truss. And uh, so top will go into compression, bottom will go into tension. And uh, the, this diagonal will carry compression in uh, compression. And this diagonal consists of concrete. And then uh, the shear force is vertical and it will cause certain amount of tension in the section that will lead to the failure. So uh, we have to actually resist this shear by using uh, adequate means. So, but there are limitations. One of the limitation is if this compression is too much, there can be crushing of this concrete and to prevent that we have to come up with some limits on the maximum compression here. And when you come up with a limit on maximum compression, finally it will impose a maximum limit on the uh, vertical shear that can act on the section. So maximum shear force Rd max is limited by the ultimate crushing strength of diagonal strut and its vertical component. So if you look at this force in the strut and uh, if the, if in shear, the distance between top, top reinforcement and bottom reinforcement is defined as Z, and we consider that the, the if this is Z, this also Z, and we consider the width of the strut is Z cos theta. So this theta, this theta, so Z cos theta is the width of the strut. <coughs> So width of the strut is Z cos theta and width of the section is BW. So that gives the area of the strut and it has to be multiplied by the strength of concrete. And if you want to get the vertical component of that, then we have to multiply it by sine theta. 
So this is the diagonal force. FCKO divided by 1.5 multiplied by area is the diagonal force. This is the diagonal force. And you have to multiply the diagonal force by sine theta, then you can get the vertical component of this. And that cannot exceed the shear force that is acting on the section. So then you will get an equation like sine theta cos theta. And sine theta cos theta is equal to one over cot theta plus tan theta. And it is also equal to 0.5 sine 2 theta because sine 2 theta is, is equal to 2 sine theta cos theta. So sometimes these relationships are used later. And generally in, uh, in, in the code, you can find this, but in, uh, in uh, most of the textbooks, they prefer to use this particular form. So then, when you look at this, we have not made any allowance for the fact that concrete can be cracked. So to allow for the fact that concrete can be cracked, we reduce this carrying capacity. And when you reduce the carrying capacity, the reduction for the carrying capacity is given by 0.6 times an equation. So you can see these, uh, these this, these values will be about 25, 30, 35. So this will be a close to 0.9. So you'll find that, you know, new one is 0 0.6 times uh, 0.9, something like 0 0.5, around 0.5. This parameter is around 0.5. But we then write it in this form. So you can multiply this equation, FCK over 1.5 by this parameter and BW is there, Z is there, sine theta cos theta is written as one over cot theta plus tan theta. And then uh, you'll see that in addition to that for Z, Z is considered as 0.9 times T. Z is considered as 0.9 times T. And that's reasonable. D is the depth to the the bottom reinforcement and the distance between top reinforcement and bottom reinforcement is considered as uh, 0.95 d. So 0.9 d. So once you substitute in all these all these parameters in this equation, in addition to introducing new a parameter new one here, you will finally end up with a an equation like this, it is given by 0.36 BWD. This is the modification factor, FCK, for theta tan theta. And uh, this is the maximum shear carrying capacity of a section. And if the actual shear applied, VED is greater than this, then you have to use a larger section. You have to basically increase the breadth or depth of the section. And generally what we do is we increase the breadth of the section or the depth of the section. But when you see this angle theta, uh, this can take various values. And uh, when uh, angle is 22, tan theta is 0.4. When tan theta is 0.4, cot theta is 1 over x, and that is 2.5. So tan theta plus cot theta is considered as 2.9. When angle is 22 degrees, when angle is 45 degrees, the addition of these two will be equal to 2. So when the angle is 22, you get 2.9 here. When the angle is 45, you get two here. So you can see when the angle is two, we get the maximum value for this. And uh, when angle is 22, we get the minimum value for the maximum shear carrying capacity. 
So there will be a minimum value and a maximum value depending on the value of theta. And if you look at uh, the equation given in the given in uh, the Euro code, the equation given is alpha C W B W Z nu one F C D over cot theta tan theta. And you will find that F C D is F C K O one point five, so it comes here. And nu one is point six times this parameter. B W the width. And uh, Z is 0.9D, and alpha CW is one for uh, reinforced concrete sections. Because uh, if you look at uh, Euro code, you will see that more all the equations are given. All the equations are given in such a way that uh, you know you can uh, deal with pre-stress concrete properties and reinforced concrete properties by using one equation. So that's why you know some parameters come in, but uh, we finally you will find they are all equal to one when you are doing when you are dealing with reinforced concrete. So the minimum value for theta is twenty-two, and when it is twenty-two, this is two point nine. So point three six divided by two point nine is equal to point one two four. 0.124 and 0.36 divided by 2 is equal to 0.18. So this will have a maximum value of 0.18 times this expression, and a minimum value is 0.124 multiplied by this expression. So you can get two equations. When the angle is 22, the maximum value is given by 0.124 times this equation. When the angle is 45 degrees, it's given by 0.18 times this equation. So, when you are dealing with the problem, most of the time we start by assuming that the angle is uh, 22 or less, which means we can use this equation straight away, and we check the maximum shear against this value. And the maximum shear acting on the section is less than this value, then nothing to worry. The section is adequate. But if the if it is more than this value, then we see whether it's less than this. So if it is in between, you know, we have to find the angle theta. But if it exceeds this value, we say the section cannot be used. Section cannot cannot be used. So. There's a minimum value and maximum value for the maximum uh, shear carrying capacity for the section. So, if the applied shear is more than this value, more than that value, the angle will be bigger than 22, but less than 45. So, we have to see what is the actual angle, and how we find that uh, that is. You know, we'll see. we look at this equation again and uh, here you can see you get this value vrd max is equal to 0.36 bwd is divided by tan theta cot theta and that is e so 1 over tan cot theta plus tan theta is sin theta cos theta so you can write sin theta cos theta here and then you can say it's equal to 0.5 times sin 2 theta So then, from that you can say sine two theta is equal to 0.36 multiplied by 0.5 times this expression. From that you can get an equation for theta. So what we do is, you know, we write this equation by substituting sine theta to cos theta here, and sine theta cos theta is 0.5 sine two theta. From that you can find what is theta. Theta is 0.5 sine Inverse V D divided by this value, but if you look at this value, it's equal to this value. So you can say the angle theta is equal to 0.5 sine inverse the applied shear force divided by the maximum shear force that the section can carry. So.
So this way you can find the angle theta, angle theta. And this is not a usual case, but sometimes in foundations, because the foundations are heavily loaded, you might find that the shear is, is more than this, but less than this. And here you can see, you know, this value is about 50% increase from this value. So there's a big chance that, you know, something might be here when it is large. So in foundations, you know, you'll have to be a little careful because the shear forces also can be large because the reason is we are dealing with uh, heavy loads, which may be due to number of flows that have been transferred onto the foundation. So you will get this equation and we can straight away say whether the, uh, at what angle this acts. So once you find the angle, once you find the angle, then for all our calculations hereafter, we use that particular angle. So if the angle is less than 22, we use 22. If the angle is in between 22 and 45, we use the actual value of the angle. And if the angle is uh, more than 45, that means we don't have a case. We have to go for a bigger section. When the shear reinforcement is designed, so basically I explain a few conditions. One is no, no nominal shear, design shear, and this is the limit. So if you are designing the shear for reinforcement, then we immediately forget about the shear component carried by concrete. And we consider that, you know, it is given by the, the reinforcement resists the vertical component of the shear. So, and it is given by ASW is the area of uh, a link divided by spacing. We'll tell you the amount of uh, uh, reinforcement available over a given length. And uh, then it is also given by Z hot theta. So you'll find that the amount of reinforcement required will be given by this equation. And this is the equation that is given in the code. And basically what we are saying is the vertical component of the, the sorry, what you are saying is the, the shear force is, is resisted by the vertical component of the applied force, sorry, the shear is uh, actually resisted by the reinforcement and the, 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 the resistance of the reinforcement is given by this equation. So this is the equation that is given in the code. And if you look at uh, this equation, this is the area of reinforcement, these are stress. So the force is given by the multiplication of these two. And uh, FYD, FYWD is the strength of steel divided by 1.15. And he said it's 0.9D. So he said it's 0.9D. And uh, FYWD is FYK divided by 1.15. So you'll find that the shear force carrying capacity of reinforcement is given by point 0.9 multiplied divided by 1.15 times strength of stress in steel or strength of steel multiplied by area of steel 
divided by the spacing that gives the that gives the, the total shear carrying capacity over a certain length for theta so when you divide 0.9 by 1.15 you get 0.78 so the equation given in the code is this and this is the equation we generally use by substituting 0.9d for z and uh, for this we substitute fyk over 1.15 where 1.15 is the factor of safety for material strength when we consider steel so here we consider the steel is carrying all the all the shear force and here we consider that steel is carrying all the shear force and uh, and is it cot theta divided by s will give the give an indication of number of links that we are going to get over a certain distance is it cot theta divided by s will give you an indication of the number of links over a certain length and that's why you get this uh, is it cot theta term in this equation so is it cot theta over s gives an indication of the number of links that you get over a certain length so and that length is the one that is actually uh, effective in this truss analogy so the shear force carrying capacity per link is given by this equation and uh, because we are considering the spacing of links then we can straight away use this equation to find the quantity of uh, the area of steel required or when you decide on the area of steel you can make use of this equation to find the spacing of the links so this how you find the spacing of links and the corresponding equation given is is given as equation 6.8 in euro code and uh, in addition to that if you look at this analogy now there is some compression here and to balance that compression there will be some tension in this bottom reinforcement so there will be an additional horizontal component for the tension and that component is given by <coughs> vd cos theta divided by sorry vd sin theta multiplied by cos theta so this we design theta this hose and the horizontal component of that that force is equal to vd sin over sin theta cos theta so you'll find that the horizontal component of that is given by vd over sin theta multiplied by cos theta or vd cot theta so now you can see why we are interested in, in this angle so to find the reinforcement we need the angle and to find the longitudinal reinforce the longitudinal force again we need this angle so that's why you know we have to see what is the inclination of the failure whether the inclination is 22 degrees or more we have to find it but it has to be definitely less than 45 degrees so to understand this better we look at an example of a beam so that uh, we can uh, see how those equations can be used for that uh, we look at this uh, example of a continuous beam having a width of 300 mm overall depth is 600 mm and uh, there are three equal spans so this is an example taken from a book so uh, i have used the diagram from the book uh, and here you know
when you design a beam generally we we design with pattern loading but here you know this beam has been designed with a single load case of maximum load equal to 190 kilonewton meters which is 1.35 dk plus 1.5 qk is 190 kilonewton meters and anyway shear is governed by the maximum load case not by the minimum load cases shear forces are generally governed by the maximum load case but to avoid any complication you know only one load case has been considered and that is the maximum load case so we have only one load case no no pattern loading so in the transverse direction so this is a flange beam where the beam is uh, actually supporting a slab the thickness of the slab is 150 mm and the beam spacing is 4 m centers so beams are located an identical beam or beam identical to this is located every 4 m and the concrete is 25 and the strength is the qt bars 500 newtons per m and the bending moment and shear force values are also given the bending moment is sagging here 428 hogging bending moment is 4 523 then it goes down to 333 here and so on when it comes to the shear force shear force is 427 here 570 here on this side 522 and 570 and 527 427 so basically single load case just to keep it clear make it clear but if we have pattern loading and you have done the analysis by using a, a computer package like sap 2000 then uh, finding these values is not a problem at all because uh, the bending moment any lock will be available and you can straight away find these values if you do computer analysis so the total ultimate load per span is 950 kN and then uh, we'll briefly look at the design of a rectangular beam supporting a slab which means it that effectively becomes a flange beam and when it is a flange beam we have to look at the width of the flange and again you see you know in euro code the way that the effective flange width is found is also a little different because uh, earlier we used to find the effective flange width based only on this length but now it is a little different and uh, first thing is you know you have to ask why we need something called effective flange width and can somebody give an answer why we need something called effective flange width why we need uh, something called effective flange width when you have a rectangular beam supporting a slab aruna do you know the answer amali Do you know the reason for considering a effective flange width? For Dilisha, Dasun, can somebody? Uh, is there anybody who knows the reason? Roshan The reason is you know uh, when you have a flange beam uh, one of the basic assumptions of reinforced concrete design is you know plain sections remain plain but when you have flange section you will find that the plain sections do not remain plain plain sections do not remain plain so when you have a, a flange section the plane sections remain plane only close to the web away from the web the uh, plane sections do not remain plane so we call this shear lag effect shear lag effect and uh, 
to compensate for the shear lag effect, we cannot use the maximum flange width. We have to limit the width of the flange. So we go for a limit on the width of the flange. And uh, then you can have a look at this particular diagram. And the width of the flange, effective width of the flange, depends on depends on the width of the web and also B effective I, which is defined as a combination of the width of the width on either side and these lengths, these lengths, L naught. It's a function of L naught and the width of the flange in between uh, the center and the edge of the web. So for our problem, we can make use of this. And first we consider N span where L0 is 0.85 L1. And uh, this width is two meters on either side. But uh, when you deduct the width of the web, which is 300, you get 1.85 meters here. So this B I is 1.85. L naught is 0.85 times 5,000. 0.85 times 5,000. And both sides are identical. So we can multiply this by two and then add it to this. So effective width of the flange is BW plus two times, 0.2 times this width plus 0.1 times this one, 0.85L. And also there's a maximum value that it means it should be less than or equals to 0.2 times L naught. So VW plus 0.2 times L naught. B effective J is as a maximum value of 0.2 times L naught. So you multiply, you substitute for that also. So then when you substitute these values, B1 is 2000 minus uh, 300 divided by, by 2850 and L is 5000. Then you'll find the effective width is 1890 millimeters and it is less than 2000 millimeters, which is the limit given by this part of the equation. So the effective flange width is taken as 1890 millimeters. And then the effective depth depends on the cover. Cover is considered as 35 millimeters, 10 millimeter links and 20 millimeter reinforcement, 545 millimeters. So which means D dash is equal to 45 millimeters, 55 millimeters. D dash is equal to 55 millimeters. D is equal to 545 millimeters. And here you can see the earlier equation, you find the lever arm and the, the alarm, lever arm is 0.97D, so it's 95D. And from that, you can find the reinforcement 1,900 millimeters squared. And we'll provide three numbers of uh, So this is strong. So we'll provide uh, four numbers. Just one moment. 428, six divided by 0.87, divided by 500, divided by 0.95, divided by 545. The answer is 1,900. So we have to provide four numbers of, uh, four numbers of, uh, Sorry, probably three numbers of H25 and two numbers of H20. So altogether five reinforcement, three of 25 and uh, two of 20. So which comes to three into 490 plus uh, two into 314, total of 2098 millimeters, not 2038, 2098 millimeters. So the area provided is 2098 millimeters squared. And we need 1,900. 
So we need uh, three numbers of 25 millimeter bars and two numbers of 20 millimeter bars. Then we'll also check the carrying capacity at the internal support. And at the internal support, the beam is bending this way, which means flange is in tension, flange is in tension. So because the flange is in tension, we have to design it as a rectangular section. And uh, the bending moment is 523. The bending moment is 523. Bending moment is 523 hogging. So it's a rectangular section. And when you calculate uh, MOB, FCK, BD squared, you get a value greater than 0.167. That means you have to doubly reinforce it. And as we have done uh, last time, you know, we can uh, determine the, the reinforcement needed to carry compression. And then we can determine the reinforcement needed to carry compression. And uh, you can see we need 788 millimeter squared, which is like uh, two numbers of, these like two numbers of 25, dime, 25 millimeter bars. And we need uh, 2,624, which is equal to something like six numbers of 25 millimeter bars. So over the support at the top, we need six numbers of 25 millimeter bars. At the bottom, we need uh, two numbers of 25 millimeter bars. And uh, so that's a reinforcement requirement. And you can also check the reinforcement requirement at the center as well. You can check the reinforcement requirement here, but you can see it's less than this value. So we might, we might be able to use the same similar reinforcement here as well, or lesser reinforcement here. So uh, then we'll go into the main topic today, that is the design for shear. And uh, so we have to check few things when it comes to shear. First thing is, you know, whether the section is adequate to resist the maximum shear. So the maximum shear comes at the face of the support. Maximum shear comes at the face of the support. So here we have uh, at the center of the support, we have 570. So we have to find what is the shear force at the face of the support. And then we have to show that, so that the value that we get is less than the maximum shear carrying capacity. And first we'll start by using the angle theta is 22 degrees. So first we start by using angle theta is 22 degrees. So if the angle theta is 22 degrees, then it is given by this equation, 0.124 times BW. If the angle is 45 degrees, it's given by 18 times BW and this is the same. So with, with this, you can see the section can carry 837 kilonewtons. And we have to find what is the shear force at the face of the support. And uh, so we have to find the shear force at the face of the support. So we know this, the load applied is 190. And width of the support is 300. So half the support is 150. So from this, you can, when you, deduct the load applied from the shear force, you can find the shear force at the face of the support, 541.5, and which means there's no problem here. If there's no problem here, there cannot be any problem here because the shear is less. So that means for all these calculations that we are going to do hereafter with respect to shear in this particular beam, we are going to use the angle as 30, 20, 22 degrees. Angle will be 22 degrees. Or tan theta plus cot theta, one over tan theta, cot theta plus tan theta will be equal to 2.9. So now we have to see what is the amount of shear links that we are going to provide. And shear links requirement is determined 
at a distance d away from the face of the support the shear link requirement can be determined at a distance d away from the face of the support so the the distance to the face of the support is 0.15 and depth to the neutral axis is 545 so once you add those two and then uh, consider the downward force within that region then you can find the shear force at the face of the at a distance d away from the face of the support so the shear force at a distance d away from the face of the support is equal to 427 minus 190 multiplied by this distance so you get 294 kilonewtons and we need to resist 294 kilonewtons so we can substitute in this equation for finding the reinforcement area and generally in shear calculations we decide a link diameter so let's say that you know we are going to use 100 millimeter uh, sorry 8 millimeter links the area of a leg is 50 millimeter squared so the area of both legs will be 100 millimeter squared so we can find the ratio asw over s which is equal to asw s is equal to 294 divided by this and uh, z is 0.9 d and this is 500 divided by 1.15 so you get 0.78 d fik cot theta and here you can see cot theta is considered as 2.5 because theta is 22 so tan 22 is 0.4 so cot 22 is 2.5 so you have to multiply substitute 2.5 here and you can see the answer is 0.553 and if you substitute 100 here then 100 divided by 0.553 is the spacing and here you get 180 millimeters spacing which means we can provide reinforcement at 175 millimeter centers so you can see when the shear capacity is exceeded, you can straight away find the reinforcement. And uh, when you find the reinforcement, you can you have to also find the horizontal component of the of the forces acting within the truss analogy or the horizontal component that arise due to shear. The horizontal component that arise due to shear is given by point five times V E D cot theta. And that is uh, shear force is 294 multiplied by 2.5. So you get a substantial value 367 kilonewtons. And if you look at the force that can be carried by a 25 millimeter bar, 25 diameter bar, and it is 213 kilonewtons. So you need about one and a half bars continuing. So we'll consider that, you know, two numbers of H25 should be available at the support with proper anchoring to resist this additional force. But in addition to that, if you look at the earlier flexural example, here again, you can see we need another 708 millimeter squared. Uh, the area for 20, 25 diameter bar is 490. So here also we need another one and a half bars. And here also we need about one and a half bars. Here also we need about one and a half bars. So which means altogether we should be continuing three numbers of 25 diameter bars onto the support as bottom reinforcement. So here you can see because the section is doubly reinforced over the support, 
we need some area of reinforcement and here in addition to that to carry the shear force again we need another area and uh, so it's about uh, this needs one and a half bars the earlier one example also we needed another one and a half bars so all together we need to continue ensure that 325 diameter bars will continue over the sub so that's how you calculate the total reinforcement requirement for shear and the important thing that you have to see is that you know because of this shear there will be some uh, you know we'll, you will not be able to curtail some of the bottom bars and some of the bottom bars need to be continued over the support so can you understand this or do you need any explanation any questions can can you all understand this or you have any questions indunil or kumar or dilsha any response please <coughs> amira can somebody uh, give a response dilsha can you understand this uh, this part was understood sir yeah, that's okay then uh, shall we take a take about 10 minutes break and then uh, start again at uh, 310 shall we take a break and then start at 310 Okay, so I'll stop here, and we'll again meet at three ten. Okay.